This is the second video in our last set of videos for E80. Today we're going to talk about state estimation, or a part of it, called prediction. If you recall, last time we discussed autonomous robot navigation, and we said that we're going to use this control loop to help us enable our robot with autonomous navigation capabilities. Today we're going to talk about the estimator and the sensors used by the estimator. So in general, state estimation can be described with two key steps, a prediction step and a correction step. You'll see different variants of this out in the state estimation world, and you should understand that state estimation is its own field in engineering. There are many different researchers around the world, probably thousands, working on new st state estimators all the time. But most of them will involve these two key steps, prediction and correction. Now often, the prediction step uses proprioceptive sensors to predict the current state of the robot. These sensors are internal to the robot. Then they'll use exteroceptive sensors to correct the predicted state of the robot. These exteroceptive sensors usually take measurements outside the robot. Let's look at this with a cool animation. In this case, we've got a rover, which you might recognize. And let's say it has moved forward in the world by spinning its wheels to maybe this new position. Now what's key here is that we are spinning wheels and we might have odometry measurements or little angular measurements that measure the angle of rotation of each wheel. Now if there's no slippage, which is a key assumption here, you can actually estimate or predict how far the robot has moved forward based on the measurement angle of those wheels. If each wheel moved one full rotation and you know the radius of the wheel and there's no slipping, you can actually determine how far that robot has moved forward. Now, unfortunately, there's probably gonna be slipping or something else that will cause a measurement error, which is why we bring in correction. These are not soda cans that I've drawn. These three cylinders are supposed to represent beacons of some sort. Now they're transponders that are placed out in the world at known locations, which might actually give us a position this blue measurement of where the robot is in the world. Now, how would that work? Might be something like GPS, or maybe you've got range measurements to each of these three beacons. But the point is, we can correct for any of the slippage errors that occurred with the prediction step by taking an absolute measurement with respect to a global coordinate frame. Now, some characteristics about these two key steps. Within prediction, usually we have very high sampling rates. You might not use angular measurements of wheels or odometry. You might also use things like accelerometers or gyroscopes. And these types of sensors usually produce hundreds to thousands of hertz measurements. Unfortunately, with things like slippage, your errors will grow and grow and grow and grow. In fact, they'll grow unbounded over time if you just use these types of measurements. And this is why we use correction measurements. Often, something like a GPS might work at one hertz or maybe 10 hertz if it's an off-the-shelf unit, nowhere near as fast as we get the measurements from IMUs or odometry. But what's nice about these correction measurements is they typically are coming from absolute position sensors where the errors are bounded. So at every iteration of your control loop, you might have a prediction step of your state estimator and a correction step of your state estimator. And then we need to fuse the measurements in both steps. We're gonna talk about in particular two key ways to get prediction of state estimates. First is using a dynamic model. Now some of our past videos showed a remotely operated vehicle or underwater vehicle model that was published in 2006, which is a set of differential equations that look like this. And if you don't remember, this is really just F equals MA. We did some lumped element modeling, which included a whole bunch of things like mass times acceleration, and then there were drag terms and input forces from thrusters. And this was actually the simple model. But what's nice about this is you can look at these inputs and if you know what they are, you can then predict the acceleration. And if you have acceleration, you can often integrate that to get velocity. And if you have velocity, you can, you can often integrate that to get position. And we do this quite often. We have dynamic models all over the place that we use to predict the motion and then the adjustment in position for every time step. Let's look at an example. Here's an RV, in fact, the one that Wang modeled in 2006 at a previous time step, and we applied some thrusters over that time step T, 
and we can plug in those thruster values into our model to isolate what the acceleration is by dividing everything by mass. And we can take that acceleration, double integrate it, to get our estimated position at the new time step. Now, as usual, there's a lot of issues with such a method. Now, first of all, that acceleration is all in the robot's local frame. So yes, we could say how much this robot accelerated forward, but that wasn't lined up with a global coordinate frame that maybe said it was in this longitude or this latitude or this X and Y. It just said how much it accelerated forward. The second issue is that that model is not going to be perfect. We can do the best we can with our system identification and try to understand all the different parameter values in that equation, but it's not going to be perfect. Even the structure itself, we might have had to make some assumptions. Maybe there's even higher order terms that we neglected. Did that equation also include any values for currents? Or whether there's a tether or cable attached to the robot, maybe pulling it back? Maybe not. All of these things can ruin the model and make prediction not so strong. Let's look at a second method. Instead of just using the math, we're going to actually take some measurements with an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. Now these units typically have three types of sensors on board, and for each sensor, there are three of them, one facing each direction. So let's look. This is a, a really, this is an old school IMU. And the reason I show this picture, uh, even though it's not nearly as compact as today's IMUs, is because you can clearly see there are three boards placed orthogonally to each other. And this indicates the fact that we have three acceleration measurements, one in each direction. Similarly, we're going to have three gyroscopic measurements, one in each direction. Now, if you don't know, a gyroscope measures the rotational rate. And we're going to have three magnetic field measurements, one in each direction. So in this particular sensor, each little board has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. And by placing them orthogonal to each other, we have three measurements, one for each of the three directions. Now, these IMUs are actually inspired by people. We all have pretty good balance, or most of us do. And a lot of that comes from our own little IMU sensors that happen in the ear. This is really cool. And in fact, if you go and look at the ear inside, you'll see that there are these three tubes. And they're actually placed at different directions with respect to each other. Now, in these tubes, fluid can flow. So here's a zoom in picture of one of these. So as someone's head moves around, the fluid can move with respect to the head in this way. And what we can do is use these things, these hair cell filaments, our little sensors within these tubes, to measure fluid going back and forth. So as you shake your head around, these little hair cell filaments will take measurements and send them through these nerves to the brain. And we can actually get the relative motion of fluid within the tube. And this is really helpful for telling the brain when the head is moving or even the body is moving with respect to the world. It allows us to keep balance, allows us to, to stay upright when we run, etc. So this is sort of our own little IMU that we have within people. Now we want to give that to robots. So we've created a whole bunch of little things that measure acceleration called accelerometers. And we make really small versions of them in our MEMS devices or microelectrical machine devices. And we stack them in IMUs. Here's a really simple description of one of these small MEMS-based accelerometers. Think of a mass with a couple springs. And we've got a displacement sensor. Something or someone holding this whole device and shaking it will obviously understand that the mass will move around based on the shaking. And depending on the amount of shaking or acceleration, this mass will move up and down. Now, if we build this little device with springs of known spring constants k, and we know the actual mass of it because we built it ourselves, so we know that m, right? and we measure the displacement, we're going to call it value x, we can therefore pull out the acceleration a. So we've actually got devices that do that. Here's a zoomed in version of one, and here's our mass, this m. And actually, it can, in this case, move up and down in this direction with these rotational springs, I guess, or cantilevers. 
But this is something that we make on a small scale. We can actually make it for pretty cheap these days. And we can put them on these IMUs to measure acceleration. Now what's nice is, as this goes up and down, it really is only going to measure the acceleration in this direction. Now I guess if the acceleration is so big, it will start to rotate over. Hmm, it sounds like there might be some uncertainty leading into our prediction step again. The gyroscope is another sensor typically found on these IMUs is something used to measure rotational rate. Now here's an old school mechanical version of a gyroscope. In this case we mounted within two nested gimbals a spinning wheel. And it's free to take on any orientation. 